Okay, so what I want to do real quick is go over the beginning of a new topic called functions. It's going to be mostly an extension of our last chapter, which was sets. So let's go ahead and hop on over and take a look at it. All right. So basically just going to be an introduction to this topic. So it's called functions and essentially what it means in terms of functions is more the idea of say like we have x squared, right? Well, we have some amount of inputs we can pass into this function and it should yield some amount of outputs. So the inputs are going to be some set and the outputs will also be a set. And it's kind of the relation we have between the inputs, outputs, the overall pairs of those, and a few other nuances to it. Now, function f that maps elements of a set x to elements of a set y is a subset of the cross product of x and y. But so for every element of x, there's exactly one element of y for which a pair, or an ordered pair of x, y, is an element of the overall function set f. So essentially, if we want a function to exist, at least in this case a well-defined function, more on that later, then every element of x must map to exactly one bad, element of y. Multiple x values can map to the same y though, which is perfectly fine. I'll explain that in a bit once we get to more details, but I digress. So, function f, x maps to y. The set x is referred to as the domain of f, whereas the set y is referred to as the target of f. Values contained with the domain correspond to all inputs, whereas all the elements within the target correspond to the outputs. So, if we had I don't know, back to x squared. The only inputs I can have maybe like two, three, six. I pass them in to x squared, that would result in four, nine, three, six. So two, three, and six would be elements within our domain. And then four, nine, thirty, six would be elements within our target. And then the overall function would be like two, four is an ordered pair, three, nine is an ordered pair, and then six. 36 is for a pair, so something like this. It's a general gist of how this is going to work. Now there's one other set to talk about, and that is going to be the range. So for again, our same function, f of x maps y, a target element is considered to be in the range of f, if and only if there is some domain element that maps to it. So range of f is a subset of the target, but not necessarily equal to the target. So let's take a look back at this Two four, and uh, you know this is two two and four. Let's just say two and four. But our possible outputs we have are four, sixteen, and twenty five. We're using x squared. So that two would map over here to four. Four map to sixteen. Let's just say for whatever reason, five is not a possible input. So this is still a potential possible output, but since nothing maps to it, it would not be in the range. The range would be 4 and 16, where the target is 4, 16, 25. This is a very, very insignificant example, but it just kind of shows the fact that the range is not always going to be equal to the target, but will always be a subset of the target. So what I just did right there previously is kind of create an arrow diagram of my function which essentially is just a visual illustration of it. So the elements of the domain are listed on our left side. We have two functions over here. And then the elements of the target are on the right side. The so domain left, ABCD, and then target right, WXYZ. So there's exactly one arrow out of every element in the domain Every target that has a map to is an element in the range of f. So let's take a look at this bullet point here. There's exactly one arrow. This is essentially what's necessary to have a function, or at least a well-defined function. So you notice that one is red and one is green. Green one, this is a proper function. Nothing wrong with this one, because if you look at every single you know, element of the domain, there is an arrow coming out exactly one. A maps to Z, B maps to Z, C maps to W, D maps to X. However, for F, 
the red one, we have A maps to X, B maps to W and to Y. And this point right here is where we do not have a properly well-defined function. Now C does map to Z, B maps to X, A, C, and the D, perfectly fine. But when we have input B, we don't know if it's W or Y. The function itself cannot determine that. We as an outside element to this function must determine if it's W or Y. So that's why it's not well defined. And then over here we see every target that is mapped to is an element in the range of F. If we look at the improper one and you it's not a proper function, but you can see everything's being mapped to. I will run G, we have W, X, Y, and Z for our target. But why is that being mapped to? So our range would be W, X, and Z. Y would be completely omitted because nothing maps to it. Hence Y range is a subset of our target. So here we have the function of X maps to A, where X is our domain, A is our target. You can see the actual sets W, X, Y, Z, a, B, C, D, and then we look at the actual relation we have. We have W maps to A, that's this pair right here for the function, X maps to A, right here, Y maps to D, here, and Z maps to C, right here. So if we were to, say, create another one here for the range, we would end up with A, C, and D, like so. Isn't too bad. Now, here we are going to have a not well-defined function because y has two outputs. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be b or d. We have to determine that ourselves. Now, if you look at it as the actual set list, you can see that we have yd, yb, and since there are two elements. that start the ordered pair with the exact same element, you can determine that there's gonna be an error diagram that has two elements being mapped to two different sources or outputs. One source maps into two different outputs, I guess that's a better way of saying that, then it's not well defined. Now, what I mean by well defined functions is there's few ways to break being well defined. But essentially, what you need is every single possible input to the function must have exactly one result. And those results must exist in the domain of our sets. Not the domain of the function, but the sets themselves. More on that in just a second. So, mathematical function f is often defined by describing how f acts on an input of x. So here we have an example of f of x equals x squared minus 2. Then we know that we're going to pass in values for x. We're going to get some output. The inputs we pass to the function are our domain. The outputs are our target. The outputs that are actually results from the function are our range. If we have inputs that do not yield an output, it's not well defined. If we have inputs that yield more than one result, it's also not well defined. Here, on this bullet point, the definition is not complete until the domain of the function, and by this I mean the possible inputs, possible outputs, is specified. So in this case, we have function g, where real numbers must all map to real numbers. So it's more of the actual domain that we've looked at in the past few chapters, it's there's a difference between the function set domain and the domain of all the inputs and outputs so if the output exists outside of the possible valid inputs and outputs defined by our domain then that function would not be well defined there's gonna be three really simple examples of not well defined functions i'm going to go over in just a second but if we take a look here we see that g of x equals the absolute value of x. Note that g maps every real number to a real number. However, by the process of this function, g does not map any number to a negative number because absolute values can never be negative. So, 
here are three functions. Some are going to be well-defined, some are not. So let's take a look at this first one. We have f of x equals 1 over x minus 1. Right off the bat, there should be something that stands out very clearly here. And that is in the case of if x equals 1, we end up with 1 over 0. And we know that that is not possible. We can't have division by 0. But in terms of if you wrote this down to an arrow diagram of 0, 1, 2, 3, let's do 2 just real quick. 2 would map to 1 over 2. 1 would map to 1. 0 wouldn't map to anything. So we have some input that doesn't map to anything, therefore cannot be well defined. So no, this is not a well defined function. Let's take a look at g of x. Well, 2. Um, real quick, let's look at 2 and 3 combined. You can take g of x is the square root of x squared plus 2, right? And then we have h of x, which equals the positive or negative square root of x squared plus 2. Now, depending on what you learn in the past on how square roots work, there is always two possible answers here. So we've got square root of 4. We know this is regularly going to be 2. We, by default, should assume the result is 2. But, technically, it could also be negative 2. And generally, at least in the case of this course, if you denote something as a square root without this symbol, the positive or negative one, then the result is going to be positive. That is just the basic assumption on square roots here. But yes, we know that you can have two. This is an example of, let's say we have, I'm gonna just change this. So uh, let's just take a look. This is not well-defined, this one is, but realistically, let's change this over to the positive or negative square root of four. It's a little bit easier to illustrate that. Or at least let's do the square root value of x. So if we pass in 4, we immediately know for positive or negative, it'll map to negative 2 and also to 2. So we know it's mapping to multiple outputs. I if I do an x squared plus 2 because it wouldn't be as clean as this, so I digress. But essentially, this symbol indicates that we are going to have more than one output for the function. Therefore, it's not a well-defined function. Up one up here, you can do division by zero, therefore you can't do this, so you end up with an input that doesn't have an output. So that also is not well defined. So again, the first and the third not well defined, middle one is well defined. Now, I said there's three instances of pretty easy to determine ones that are not well defined. So let's go ahead and go over that third one. So Note from earlier that we had all real numbers mapped to all real numbers. And that's just a general case for this course. Everything we're dealing with is real numbers. Let's just say we have the broad scope of everything that we deal with in the course. The result of this is not a real number. You end up with 2i. Because we end up with a square root or square root of a negative value. It's going to have i, i is an imaginary number, which would exist outside of all possible target results. Therefore, this is not a well-defined function. And that's the third one. Those three are very easily determined to not be well-defined functions. So, moving on, we have something a little bit more simple, like function equality. And this is essentially just every other chapter we've had, we've had ways of determining that some set is equal to another set. In this case, we have some function is equal to another function. So two functions f and g are equal. f and g have the same domain target and f of x equals g of x for every element x in the domain. And we used to note that as f equals g. So some examples here would be for function f, real numbers all not real numbers. 
f of x equals x squared plus one. And then we have g, r maps to all positive real numbers. g of x equals x plus one squared minus two of x. And it's already just to know that these are going to be equal to each other. But if we want to do an example, we can just look at um, uh, Suzu zero. So zero squared plus one is one. Zero plus one is one. Squared is one minus two times zero, which is zero, one. Okay, so zeros are both one. And let's take a look at one. So one squared plus one is two. One plus one is two. Squared is four minus two times one. Those are examples right there. And then we have another one out here of these are just all real numbers. f of x equals absolute value of x. And g of x equals the square root of x squared. If I pass in zero, absolute value zero. Zero squared, square root zero. Do one, absolute value of one is one. One squared, square root of one, one. Let's do negative one. Absolute value negative one, one. Negative one squared is one. Square root of that, one. So, even though these functions are both different, just like these two functions are both different, the results, the inputs, outputs, all be the same. So they are functionally equal. And then we have two examples of some pretty common uh, computer-based functions with the floor and eventually we'll get to the ceiling function next. The floor function maps a real number to the nearest integer in the downward direction. So floor is all real numbers mapped to integers or floor x equals the largest integer y or y is less than or equal to x. It's a node kind of like a x with the like a round in brackets with the top part cut off. So if we did Let's say floor of 5.4. Largest integer, y is less than or equal to x. So that would map to 5. We have, um, let's do 0 0.9. That'd map to 0. Let's do negative 3.5. So it's the largest integer in the downward direction. So if we floor this, we end up with negative four. Oh. It's not rounding. So we're not gonna go in based on the decimal point. We're just going in a particular direction. If it was 3.1, it's still be negative four. If it was 3.9, negative four, because it's going in a downward direction. Same thing 5.4 could be 5.8. 0.9 could be 0 0.247, still going to be 0. So this always rounds, not rounds, but always. I guess I'm just going to say round. It rounds in the downward direction. <laughs> Essentially, that's about how it works. Ceiling, exact opposite. So we're just going upward direction. Yeah, I mean, it sounded safe to say rounds because even written there in the definition but it's just not rounding but I'm, I'm rambling ceiling brackets bottom parts cut off two examples yeah the examples it's going to be uh 4.2 negative 0.5. So 4.2 is going to map to 5. Negative 9.3 is going to map to negative 9. 0 0.5 will map to 1. So again, going to the nearest, enter, nearest integer in the upward direction. And that's about it. So hopefully that wasn't too bad. And hopefully it's not too long winded. Again, it's a pretty simple concept. We have two sets with the inputs to a function, outputs to a function, all the ordered pairs of the input to the output, potential range, which are all the actual targets that are being mapped. And that's kind of about it. So not too much. Mostly this is really an extension of sets 
which is fine. And again, it is how we end up with actual functions in map. And then we extend that idea to the individual parameters and outputs and returns in computer science for like Python C++ functions. So it all is kind of the same. We all derive it from logic, which is pretty much the general gist of this course. So hope that made sense. We'll expand upon this in the next video, and I hope to see you there. So as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you later.